Stephen Cole, and I'm honoured to be your moderator for today's webinar, which is called Achieving Water Security in a Changing World. And it's supported by the Al Alatir Foundation in partnership with Refinitiv. The Al Alatir Foundation is an independent think tank aiming to provide robust and practical knowledge and insights on global energy and sustainable development topics and communicate these for the benefit of the Foundation's members and community. Just before we start, as usual, uh, the, uh, the housekeeping rules for any technical issues during the webinar, you can click on the chat bubble, type your concern, and my colleague Juhaina will assist you. Please click on the three horizontal buttons below to activate the Q&A and poll window on your screen. For any questions for the speaker, you can click on the Q&A and direct the question to me as the presenter. Please note in the interest of time, we may be unable to address all the questions with the speakers and really focus your, your question when you have one. During the session, you'll be taking part in polling questions. They'll appear on the screen and allow you 30 seconds to respond to the poll. So let's put some context together, some perspective for today's uh, webinar. The UN Sustainable Development Goal, the SDG number six, is access to clean water and sustainable sanitation to all by 2030. So just a decade left. While substantial progress has been made in increasing access to clean drinking water and sanitation, billions of people, mostly in rural areas, still lack these basic services. Worldwide, it's estimated that three in 10 people lack access to safely managed drinking water services. Six in 10 people lack access to safely managed sanitation facilities. Two out of five people don't even have basic hand washing facility with soap and water, so vital in this age of COVID. And more than 892 million people still practice open defecation. Water Action has forecast there may be a 40% shortfall in freshwater resources by 2030. And this coupled with uh, a rising world population and increasing water pollution has the world careering towards what could be and what will be if it's not uh, changed a global water crisis. Recognizing the growing challenge of water security, the UN General Assembly launched the Water Action Decade on the 22nd of March 2018 to mobilize action to help transform how we manage water. Water scarce regions in particular, and the need to use all available sources to relieve water stress levels, including the massive volumes of wastewater generated from oil and gas operations, are all vital here. With most oil and gas production occurring in arid regions where water supplies are constrained, to say the least, there is strong interest among some regulators for reuse one. Integrating wastewater reuse with desalination also provides a more sustainable approach to water management, while a biosolids, the nutrient-rich rich byproduct of the wastewater treatment process, can be used to fertilize uh, arid land. However, the treatment of industrial wastewater comes with environmental and economic challenges and requires responsible practices and smart regulations, uh, and they need to make sure it's done in the right way. To meet the SDGs and ensure food and water security, it's crucial to develop and implement environmentally friendly waste and water management solutions, which is the topic for today's webinar. So let's uh, meet the speakers for this session. Um, Abu Rahman H.G. Mackey, uh, I shall call him Mr. Mackey from now on, Land and Water Officer, Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN. Dr. Juad al Karaz, Head of Research, Middle East Desalination Research Center. Johnny Obed, Vice President of the Olia Water Technologies. And Constantina Toli, a theme leader and Senior Program Officer, Global Water Partnership Mediterranean. An extremely august and high level uh, panel. Let's go to uh, Constantina. Um, and uh, Constantina Toli, can you give us your presentation? Thank you, Stephen. Good morning to all. It is a pleasure to be here on behalf of the Global Water Partnership Mediterranean. Uh, 
I would start with uh, some facts that they have already been presented by Stephen, and these include uh, the current uh, situation when it comes to water resources and actually uh, access to the basic water services, uh, drinking water, sanitation, etc. But of course, Stephen has already presented these. Uh, so, I would like to focus on, on two key visuals, and those have to do with uh, water stress and irrigation. And I won't be entering into details. I think the colors themselves speak uh, for the truth. So, in, in the picture on the left, you see this map of water stress areas, and I'm focusing on the areas that are close to uh, uh, include the region and uh, North Africa. Uh, our region, the Mediterranean, is the most water in the world, so you can see a lot of red there. So eventually, this is what we're suffering from. So fresh water resources are not enough, and uh, we have a very high uh, level of water stress. If we take into consideration that agriculture is also one of the main uh, of the key economic activities in the country, uh, then you understand that this stress goes even higher. The picture on, uh, on the right is uh, a forecast of uh, climate variability and change. So, what do we expect uh, do we expect to happen? So, you see the colors turning from uh, from green in an already water stressed uh, region. They are turning into red, and those are the first forecasts. Um, of uh, change in temperature. So the higher the temperature, that means that we have less water resources, we have less precipitation, less rains, uh, eventually less water, surface water, and less uh, water in the, uh, in the aquifers. So that was the challenge. Of course, it was not the only challenge because we have more. Uh, we have population growing. We have another. Uh, we have a number of other challenges, including the current situation of, of the pandemic, where we need more water. So, what are the stakes? Uh, I will just focus on two key facts. How much GDP is affected by uh, the water stress? So, in the world, uh, thirty percent of uh, GDP is uh, exposed to, to high or very, very high water stress. Uh, in our region, uh, in Middle East North Africa, 61% uh, of the population is exposed to high or very high water stress, and 71% of GDP. I think those figures themselves are really striking because we understand that it's not only about water, water per se. It's about the economy, it's about our life, it's about our ecosystem. So everything depends on water. And uh, as Stephen uh, mentioned in his introduction, actually we are lacking, we are lagging behind. SDG progress is indeed lagging behind. So I won't go into the details, but if you see the, the blues the, and, and the oranges in the figure on the right, you will understand that uh, when it comes to SDG 6, uh, which is water, we are still lagging uh, behind. So blue is the one that is already on track, and everything else is the, what we need to work on. So what do we need eventually? We need solutions. And what are the solutions? We need to improve water efficiency. We need to reduce trade waste, uh, uh, treated wastewater. We need to go to invest more in sustainable desalination, not just desalination. Um, we need sustainable water management, and we also need uh, awareness. And those would eventually increase our water security. And in order to do this, we need to, to have, of course, the political will. So the governments need to understand the, how critical water security is and how it is interlinked also with other sectors. So going through an nexus of roads that eventually uh, affects uh, energy, food, and ecosystems is, uh, is the right approach to go about it. So we cannot actually have, we cannot um, produce water through desalination or treat wastewater if we don't have uh, energy or these would eventually affect uh, food security. 
And of course, we need technologies, we need innovation, we need state-of-the-art technologies in order to minimize the risks, especially of pollution and contamination. But most importantly, I would really like to, uh, to stay with that one. We need a new water culture. We need uh, both consumers, we need decision makers that understand the value of water. In order to act on water security, you need to understand the value of water. And you, uh, our audience, as water users, you also need to understand what is what you need to do as a consumer. So please don't let your path running. There are people that are trying to wash their hands and we don't have enough water. Thank you very much. Constantina, that was excellent. Thank you very much indeed for that. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to step on your thunder by laying out some of the figures uh, to begin with. Uh, but uh, you, you more than made up for me. Um, and that rhetorical question of yours, what are the stakes? Well, I think that's answered by everybody. They are very high, um, but uh, certainly agree uh, we need a new water culture. Um, let's start now uh, with our first poll question. Um, and that is, what do you believe is the most significant barrier to the mainstream reuse of industrial wastewater, and you have four choices. A is high treatment cost. B is potential chronic toxicity of the treated wa produced water. C is public acceptance. And D is the lack of a one-size-fits-all solution due to the changing amounts and properties of industrial wastewater over the lifetime of an oil or gas field. So we're going to see the results. There you are, you can see it on your screen now in a few seconds. Uh, it'll be uh, a quicker result of the poll than you'll find in America on November 3rd, which could take several weeks uh, if the number of postal votes <laughs> are ever counted. Um, but we should know in just uh, a few seconds. Uh, and I think the poll is closed now, uh, and uh, that should be coming up very soon. After we see the results of that poll, um, I will move on to the obstacles um, uh, to using industrial wastewater um, and uh, why there are obstacles. Okay, so the poll is over and uh, there are the results. So 33% um, believe the high treatment cost Second is public acceptance. Yeah, I think that's very interesting that uh, B and D are equal. Uh, so potential chronic toxicity and the lack of a one-size-fits-all solution. Yeah, that's, that's uh, absolutely right. All right, let's move on um, and go to Jared Alcaraz. Uh, welcome, uh, Jared. Um, head of research, Middle East Desalination Research Center. One of the biggest obstacles to industrial wastewater reuse is public uh, acceptance. We've just seen that confirmed. Although existing technologies have been demonstrating or demonstrated already to meet um, drinking water standards, there are concerns over the unknown uh, toxic uh, effects, toxicity, in other words, potential toxicity in compounds. What can the industry do to persuade us to address these concerns. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, the organizer, for having me. Uh, yes, uh, very uh, interesting question. I think the, the public acceptance and the willingness to implement wastewater use project is highly connected with the grade of uh, water scarcity in the country. As you know, the rate of uh, wastewater treatment uh, uh, in the, is still low in many, in many countries in the region. Uh, many wastewater treatment plants are poorly maintained and operate beyond the design capacity. Uh, uh, treated waste uh, reuse varies from country to another, obviously depending on the treated effluents, quality standards, and, uh, and policies. Uh, so while growth of wastewater will be driven by population growth, um, uh, wastewater will need investment to extend collection and treatment network. So most important, wastewater recycling needs to be explicitly included in national water planning policies and will design campaigns are needed to ensure the public acceptance, which is one of the challenges as we saw in the poll uh, of its use. Industry should definitely continue investing in R&D, uh, connect with academia, go for more environmentally friendly products and processes that minimize the discharge 
of toxic compounds. In addition, it needs to recycle the wastewater within its own process to reduce the discharge to, to the environment. In, in Oman, for example, the treated effluent quality standard is following standard A, as stated by the ministerial decision uh, 14593, which is the highest class quality. Thus, treated water toxicity is not valid as much as biological contaminants, bacteria, and viruses, which may grow if the chlorine uh, uh, residual is not sufficient causing health uh, uh, problems. Uh, so, although the, the treated effluent quality is of high uh, quality, but its applications are limited to irrigation and industrial purposes, as stated in that, uh, in that uh, decision. The source of wastewater counts also uh, the major criteria and the designing the treatment unit, as well as the effluent applications. For example, municipal wastewater don't contain high toxicity and heavy metals as industrial do. That is why, for example, here in Oman, we don't combine all sources, municipal and industrial, in one system. Meanwhile, we segregate and focus on municipal wastewater application, avoiding any hazardous and risk to the end users, uh, uh, so the applications will be wider and feasible. Finally, in absence of social support uh, um, uh, of any reuse project uh, may fail. By working on the public as well as the institutional acceptance, one has also to keep in mind that wastewater reuse has different driving forces. First is supplemental water supply in water scarce region as, a, as our region. And second, it can be viable alternative to the disposal of treated effluent and reverse coastal water and deal with a driving force also for region and humid climate. Right, okay, a lot in there, Joad. Thank you very much. I, I want to bring in uh, Johnny now. Um, Johnny Obed, Vice President of Veolia Water Technologies. Um, because we've had some issues uh, outlined by Constantina, Joad, and Mackie. Um, so, what are the techno? We are in a technological age. What are the Johnny the technological, um, the promising technologies available for improving wastewater treatment and expanding, of course, that vital use of reuse of wastewater? Okay. Hi, Stephen. Thank you for having me. Uh, fortunately enough, there are several technologies today and most of them are already implemented, and I will give some examples later. Up upgrading the existing conventional wastewater treatment plants by adding advanced tertiary treatment systems such as disk filter, microfiltration, ultrafiltration are available, uh, UV, chlorine disinfection for irrigation, and or with membrane system, generally UF and RO, for use or as cooling water, on boilers also, to feed water. And if very specific reuse water quality are needed on a higher recovery of water is expected, then treatment with activated carbon or flotation can be added, or evaporation and crystallization on the RO brine for reuse. And we'll give later an example on what we call zero liquid discharge that was implemented in Qatar for the first example in the region. So technologies are available. It will depend, of course, on the cost. It will depend on the quality of the effluent. But technologies today, the industry has several technologies for the for the reuse. So you would say, Johnny, you're optimistic because there are the technologies out there. It's just a question, really, of cost of using and developing them. Yeah, and the social acceptance. And social acceptance, yeah, which of course we we saw in in our first poll. All right, let's go. We heard of, uh, from Mackie a little earlier about some of the lessons. Uh, Constantina, what important lessons? Uh, and I'll ask Constantina and maybe Mackie to come in again uh, to uh, explain a, a little more about the lessons. What lessons can we learn? What can what can we take from the reuse applications of other non-industrial wastewaters? Constantina first. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stephen. Well, first of all, we need to understand that uh, treated wastewater is a source of water. This is the main, the, the key uh, lesson, uh, the key takeaway. So it's one of the sources. We don't really need sources of water to be of the same quality. So it depends on the eventual use. So it, it is what we call fit for purpose. So everything that we choose around it, has to be has to take into consideration what the end use is. So if we need water, if we treat water uh, in order to be used 
for potable water, as it is the case of uh, new water in Singapore, for example, then we have to apply the highest levels of uh, uh, treatment and, of course, make sure that the quality that it is a water that is safe to be consumed in as potable water. If we're talking agriculture, again, there are also different levels of treatment depending on the type of uh, the, the, the end use. So it's a different thing to grow vegetables, it's a different thing to grow fodder. So eventually, this is what we need to, to make sure that we do. We choose the appropriate technologies for the end use. And we have seen, uh, of course, in water stress areas that we improve water management and we actually bridge this gap because eventually what we're talking about is there's a gap in water availability. We don't have the water budget is, is missing. So we are adding water to this water budget by treated wastewater as long as we take into consideration and we truly abide by the uh, the standards of, of quality in order to, to use it properly. And of course, water standards vary, unfortunately, so much uh, uh, around the world. Mackie, did you want to um, uh, come in a little more on that? Uh, I know you did cover lessons earlier. Uh, if not, yeah. I'll move on. Yeah, just I want to add one single point. Yeah. Uh, is the, the, the importance of keeping a close eye on the quality of the treated wastewater. Because this is what undermines the social acceptance. And, because this is the also very difficult issues because the finance is also an issue, but this is kind of a decider, you know, a decision maker to, to put the money that is required. But to convince him, that decision maker, to take the treated wastewater into consideration for irrigation or for drinking water even, but the most important thing is to have a quality which is acceptable. And is that, is that aimed at improving the quality of the source? Um, so what actually comes to the treatment plant is of a better quality. Uh, is that true? And, and if it is true, how feasible is it? There, there, this is, you know, there's two things. The water that comes to the treatment plant is one issue. It has to be separated. Municipal wastewater and industrial wastewater should receive different pre-treatment, definitely. Those two types of wastewater from two different sources should be treated in different plants, and then be mixed when, a, when they reach a similar quality level and, and reuse it for a defined purposes. Specific infrastructure is therefore required, and this should be looked at from the cost benefit efficiency. But when it comes out from the plant, it has to have steady, acceptable quality level. You know, the quality varies often, specifically in our region, and decision maker doesn't want to be responsible for, you know, uh, supporting waters that can cause somehow health issues later on. So the keeping the quality is very important. So this goes with management of treatment plants. Right. Okay. Right. Well, let's go to Dr. El Caraz. Um, uh, Dr. Caraz, uh, although seawater reverse osmosis is, uh, I think everybody on the panel knows, the most efficient or energy efficient commercial seawater desalination technology. Now, I know all about that in, in Qatar, certainly. Uh, it still requires high amounts of energy, uh, and that's fine as long as the energy is, is cheap. Uh, yeah. how, much, how much progress has been made in the use of energy recovery devices and integration of renewable power into desalination? Yeah, thank you very much, Stephen, for this question. Uh, yes, definitely, energy efficiency of the RO desalination uh, has increased significantly in the last five decades. Uh, if you look at the, at, the, at, the, at the energy efficiency, you know, 20 years ago, it improved significantly. So the increase obviously is not is due to membrane chemistry, module design, high efficiency efficiency pumps, innovative system design, but in particular the energy recovery devices. So uh, more frequently, uh, system designers are being asked to minimize, you know, uh, uh, the specific energy consumption. Uh, uh, even in areas where the cost of power is relatively low. So by far the largest contribution is decrease of energy efficiency uh, 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 and the specific energy consumption over the past three decades has been the advancement made in the energy recovery devices. Uh, so all ARDs now use it uh, uh, in the water treatment industry, uh, 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 reduce power 
by harnessing the energy and the concentrate of the brain waste uh, steam and transferring it to the feed side via various uh, various methods. Uh, isobaric or positive displacement devices uh, such as TPX pressure exchanger devices uh, are the most efficient solution available today and can reduce the energy consumption of seawater RO system by 60%. So there is really a, a very a, a big advancement of progress in this area. I, I, I expect that in the upcoming five years, there will be still margin to improve a little bit this, uh, this area. On the other hand, renewable desalination, obviously now uh, all the countries are committed to the Paris Agreement, energy transition uh, commitment. So we, we are witnessing now more and more renewable desalination projects. It's clear that at, uh, down, at low scale, so it's uh, very popular now in remote areas where we don't have to agree. But at bigger scale, there is some improvements. It's not, not that much as we, we wish, but I think it, it, there will be a big improvement in the, the next uh, next 10 years. So we have, uh, uh, you know, CSP with thermal desalination. We have PV with RO. We have wind energy powering, you know, desalination units. We have some uh, good examples. For example, Al Hafji plant in Saudi Arabia. They are producing 60,000 cubic meters per day, and this is powered by solar. We have uh, Perth plant in Australia, which is producing. Uh, more than 120,000 cubic meters per day, which is uh, powered by wind farm. And we have also in Morocco, Agadir plant, which is uh, expected to, uh, to start operation next year, producing 450,000 cubic meters per day. Half of it will be for agriculture, and this is powered indirectly by uh, the world of that or Noor uh, solar plant. So there is a little bit improvement in this area. And definitely, I think the, the commitment of the countries, the incentives from the government, the PPPs or the public-private partnership will definitely encourage uh, this, this uh, coupling renewables with this nation and also to reduce the CO2 footprint uh, in, the, in, the, in the future. Perfect. I mean, to, to a non-scientist like myself, the thought of solar energy and desalination is almost like the perfect storm, isn't it? Um, but I wonder, sort of, what is the, the, the way to go forward? Who will drive this? Can legislators drive it? Do standards play a part in accelerating the use of wastewater uh, and increasing public acceptance of reuse technologies? And I'm thinking particularly, of course, in the MENA region, the arid MENA region, largely. The question is for me. Yes, you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, definitely, a regulatory system of directives can be a tool for helping to get public acceptance and willingness to implement a reuse project. In many Arab countries, regulations and standards related to water use have been implemented uh, in a piecemeal fashion, if I, if I can say. Uh, it's it's uh, therefore worth considering an overhaul of regulations and standards to be harmonized and simplified. Such an effort helps ensure ease of following and uh, you know enforcement mainly, and to achieve general acceptance of reuse schemes. Uh, it is of fundamental importance to have active uh, uh, public involvement from the planning phase through the full implementation process. Uh, uh, an interesting example for wastewater reuse, uh, for example, we have in, 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 the, in the region, we have in Sharjah in UAE, we have in, uh, in Oman, we have in Jordan, the, the Herbert Samra wastewater treatment plant. So uh, implemented projects like this, I mean, uh, like those kind of projects in semi-arid or arid regions, uh, show again that public acceptance and the willingness to implement such project is highly connected with the grade of water scarcity in the country. So uh, obviously I can give more, more examples, but I yep. think also, yeah, that's the last point. The psychological uh, factor is essential uh, for initiating, implementing, and sustaining the long-term wastewater reuse uh, uh, programs everywhere in the region. I, I want to go to Constantina next, but I wonder if Johnny wanted to come in and, and talk about that as well. Yes, yes. <clears throat> Actually, we have a quite a representative uh, example uh, one in Qatar, actually, where Shell Pearl in GTL in Qatar, from the onset, decided to go for zero liquid discharge. <laughs> so they have, although they have a small desalination plant, uh, today they are fully autonomous in terms of water and even produce more water than their requirement, with the excess water produced being today used for irrigation. So the same could be easily done for produced water. And you know today in the Gulf, more and more water is needed on older oil fields for injection to recover the oil in the reservoirs. The produced water today, I mean the water that comes back with the oil, increases in quantity and the ratio compared to the extracted oil. So treating this water, which is a big volume, to the quality needed for re-injecting it, it's a very good way 
to preserve big amounts of water today and resources. Lovely. So Veolia already sold such reused plants for Tatwir in Bahrain as well for such application. So this area is one of the biggest water reuse that we can treat today in the Gulf, which is depending a lot on the oil production. Exactly. And we have also started that KSC treated sewage effluent plant for Katra in Sharjah as well, where the treated water is then sold to process water by Katra for various industrial reuse. Excellent. Yeah, a good combination of industry and ecology. Um, Constantina Tolly, besides technology, what else would you say is needed to promote the safe reuse of industrial water uh, and, of course, uh, improve water security? Well, of course, uh, apart from the technology itself, we need to make sure that it works. Actually. So we need the, the legal and regulatory framework, and we need very close monitoring, as the previous speakers have uh, emphasized on. It is really critical that we, we ensure that the quality is of the standards for the use uh, intended. Apart from that, we need social acceptance, and I think that was one of the interesting findings of the poll, especially in, in, in a region where religious concerns are of uh, critical importance. Uh, the acceptance is also uh, affected by uh, the, the guidance given by uh, religious leaders. So if it is an accepted use to reuse this water, then of course, then the uptake of uh, reused water would be higher. But apart from that, we need to, to ensure and we need to work more on education. Uh, eventually, we, we uh, develop our mindset through education, so we need to understand that, and we also need to integrate this in our education, education for sustainable development. In the school curricula, we need to understand that water is not only what runs through a river or what we can find in a microbe. There are several sources of water, and they are equally fit for the purpose that we need them. That's, that's a key point. I mean, it, it emphasizes what you need, what you said at the beginning. We need to understand the value of water. So maybe we should all, as panelists, be going into classrooms uh, to teach the value uh, of water. Um, but just, just uh, tell us a little more about your experience in developing a new water culture in severely stressed communities. What were the, some of the most effective approaches you developed to, uh, to increase awareness of sustainable water use? Uh, in our programs uh, with the Global Water Partners in the Terrain, and this would work in the region, uh, we, uh, we have always a holistic approach. So we eventually complement every technical uh, project with awareness raising and education for sustainable development. So we develop uh, uh, programs that are related to the country and the specific needs, so not everything is the same. So we have customized, custom-made uh, school curricula where we work in the classrooms with the teachers and with the students yeah. to promote this, uh, uh, to the understanding of water, the value of water. And of well, I got ahead of myself, didn't I? <laughs> well, I think you're ahead of me today <laughs> in any case. And this is really this is really great because we eventually need media as well. We don't only need teachers uh to, to promote the value of water, but I think the critical role of media media plays a critical role. So if you do not support us in our efforts, no matter how hard we try all the international organizations or the technology providers, the policy makers Media plays a critical role. Everybody is on social media. Everybody reads everything online. So it is your role, Stephen. Uh, we are expecting this, you know, this support from your end. Well, but can course, I tell you, uh, 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 Constantina, that in fact, before I was even going to talk about water on this webinar, I had planned to do a complete show on water, which will be happening in a few weeks' time. So there you are. Great. Great. I'm very happy to hear that because we have always believed that we need education, we need the media to be on our side, and of course to reach out to the general public we need to have um, an appropriate awareness raising campaigns that speak you know, the same language you know, as the general public does. 
Yeah. So they need to understand, you know, in simple words, no technical words. Nobody wants to, to hear, you know, about what RO is and what the benefits of RO is. Eventually, what they need to hear is that the water, treated wastewater, is safe for them to use, to drink it, to, uh, to water their uh, crops. This is what they really need to, to understand. And uh, especially with the role, as I said, of social media working on uh, customized uh, campaigns, but not only on that, because eventually, you know, we don't reach, you know, for example, the farmers like that. We need to engage them in dialogues and we need to, to go close to them and talk to them and make them understand, you know, that this is a safe water to use. It, it gets, that's an excellent point. And one I'll put to Mackie, I think, uh, because uh, as you know, Mackie, agriculture, uh, farming irrigation is the oldest application of water reuse. Tell us a little about what progress has been made in recent years to improve water reuse in agriculture. What, what best practices have you observed in the areas of collection of trade, uh, of storage, uh, and transfer of treated wastewater? Thank you, Stefan. Uh, wastewater has been used for agriculture to grow more food and make use of those precious water and uh, uh, nutrient resources. When it appeared that uh, this can also have adverse impact on, on health, on food quality, uh, WHO and FAO guided the member states for the application of safe use regulations and standards to protect public health and facilitate national use of wastewater in agriculture. WHO published in 1973 a reference guideline for wastewater treatment and health safeguard. That's how it's called. Then it has been updated in 89, then in 2006 to take into account the recent scientific evidences concerning pathogens and chemicals. Uh, with the growing concern of antimicrobial resistance and the COVID-19 pandemic, FAO and WHO came again together and developed early this year in 2020 a technical okay. brief on wastewater management to prevent infection and reduce the spread of antimicrobial resistance. So driven by the water scarcity and growing volume of wastewater, more and more countries set up their priorities to increase the collection, treatment, and reuse of treated wastewater. In the NENA region, Oman, Qatar, we have also Jordan that appears as a champion, but none has so far reached the full collection, full treatment, and full reuse. Because this comes with very important investment in infrastructure, you need to know that you know the number of wastewater treatment plants are rapidly growing in this region especially, specifically, as well as the treatment and reuse rate. The challenge, the challenge is that the production site, the treatment plant, and the reuse site, the farms, are quite distant. And the direct reuse from the treatment plant to the farm could offer very limited options in terms of geographical reuse. It has to be done in the surrounding farms. Uh, the, the best practice I want to share is the one of, of Jordan. It is indirect use that has been used to rapidly increase the rate of reuse from around 3% to 85% in 20 years, in less than 20 years. Indirect use consists of discharging the treated wastewater into rivers or streams. Uh, in Jordan, we can, we can mention the examples of a Samra wastewater plan that is transferred into King Salah dams where they are mixed with the fresh water. The extended storage time improves the quality of the treated wastewater and is diluted in the Zerka River before they are using irrigation of crop in the Jordan Valley. This is very interesting examples that has uh, that has you know increased the reuse rate in Jordan quite um, rapidly. 
Is it expensive, Mackie? It does, of course. <laughs> this comes with a lot of infrastructures, but you know the most important thing is the is the, is the vision where the country wants to do something. You know, the money is is, is you can always find it. As it has been said by my many colleagues here, is is the public acceptance, is the decision maker who is deciding to go towards those technologies and, and reuse. Yeah. That's the and, most important and complicating. And, and I suppose you need regulations and policies to promote financing. Definitely, definitely. You know, as I said, you, you need to have, first of all, a vision you know, where, where you want to go. Are you want to use full, every drop of wastewater produced must be reused, okay? That it could be half of it, you know, we are targeting half, 10%, but it has, there isn't a vision. Then, for purpose, policy need to be put in place, defining a purpose, what type of water we have, and what type of reuse we are targeting. It okay. could be for niche agriculture, high value quality, high value product, urban or very urban agriculture or specific crop production, food okay. security, water security. And then we need to come to the institutional framework because it is also very lacking uh, elements and uh, the framework, the organization arrangement and so on. We could talk a long time about institutional frameworks, but we're not going to. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm just, because of, sort of I, I, because we've got a second poll coming up, but before we do that, I want to go to Johnny. Johnny Obeyed, uh so you can give us one to two uh, successful examples of industrial facilities or cities that have integrated water reuse successfully in their daily uh, existence and operation. Okay. Uh, today we have like more than <clears throat> twenty examples of industrial uh, facilities that have reused, uh, they reuse water, most of which is coming in the, in the field of uh, cooling, the cooling systems, which is a very easy field that uh, a lot are practicing it uh, than other area where we have, like, for instance, food industries, which are a bit more reluctant uh, to reuse, uh, the reuse uh, wastewater. So, and the technologies that we're using most often is the treated sewage effluent reuse plant are now well developed. And the most typical application, as I said, is cooling tower feed. This is particularly valid for all recent real estate development in the UAE and Qatar. And we have several uh, references in this regard. All right. Uh, thanks, uh, Johnny. Okay, well, let's, let's go now um, to our second poll. Um, and the, the, the question, there it is on your screen, what strategy should governments and independent water producers consider to strengthen water security and sustainability? A, expand the use of treated industrial water. B, expand seawater desalination. C, add treated wastewater to potable water networks. And D, raise water rates. I'm very glad to say in London, my water rate has just come down. Um, that's because I complained to Thames Water, but there you are. Um, but uh, I'm sure trying to balance uh, water rates is extremely difficult, um, especially at the moment, because, again, to the dreaded word COVID, more people, certainly in Europe, are spending more time at home. Uh, and I suspect in the Middle East and around the world, too. And so the consumption of water uh, is going to be a lot higher. So we will get the results uh, of that poll uh, in just a second. What strategy should governments and independent water producers consider to strengthen water security and sustainability? They're not always the same thing, uh, sadly. And there's your answer. Well, expand the use of treated industrial water. And I think the panel would uh, certainly agree with that is the number one answer. Secondly, expand seawater desalination. Uh, certainly, if you are a coastal country, that would be uh, acceptable. Uh, three, so we've gone down as per our, our poll questions, add treated wastewater to potable water networks and raise water rates. Um, uh, lady and gentlemen, any comments on that poll? Uh, 
from my point of view, I think yes, it's uh, it's uh, I expected that uh, th those responses. I think definitely we need to expand the use of uh, of treated wastewater. I think uh, it's very low in the in the region in general, uh, except Jordan or some countries who are really in uh, I mean very water scarce uh, countries. Uh, and then desalination definitely it's become an, uh, an option of water supply. I mean a lot of improvement in terms of uh, environmental impact in terms of the cost. So even now countries with uh, with with no uh, fossil fuels uh, uh, sources like Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt are starting investing in uh, in desalination. Uh, the the water, water pricing policies, I think, is an, an important aspect also to take into consideration because, uh, as, as you said, there is a lot of consumption, I mean, now because of the COVID-19, but it's already a very high consumption per capita in the region, so we need to do some, some effort on, on this regard. And the last uh, point is we need to, uh, you know, to, uh, to enforce or to apply, you know, the, the participatory approach of integrated water resource management. So we need to engage people. For example, the third option, it's possible in Singapore, but I'm not sure it could be possible in the region. Despite, I mean, regardless the technology cost, uh, it's uh, the acceptance that we mentioned in the discussion, so it's a, a big issue. So this is, I think, my two cents uh, uh, regarding this. Okay. Um, anybody else want to comment on this poll? Uh, look, there is an interesting finding here. Add rated wastewater to portable water network is receiving quite low engagement. This is, this is the translation of public acceptance. People are not confident enough to mix their portable water network with the treated wastewater, even though it could be of the same quality or even better. Yeah, yeah. of course. Of course. And, 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 and it is a good point. Uh, Constantina? Well, I also find these uh, uh, the, the responses actually what I, what I also expected, and I understand what Mikey was saying that we're not comfortable with adding treated wastewater into our networks. But eventually, uh, the use of water for portable reasons is they, is much lower than any other uses for water, including. Uh, agriculture and industrial use. So eventually, we should be investing more into covering these needs and also providing more water for, for ecosystems. And then, of course, if there is an opportunity of high quality water for portable use, we could explore this as well. But eventually, what we need to see, and it's also clear from our audience, that we need to expand the use of critic based water. So everything that we have said in these almost one hour, I think, is very um, it should be taken into consideration in order to improve this use. And of course, uh, coming from an IWM organization, as you uh, was saying, uh, we need a participatory approach and we need to, to include those stakeholders in this uh, decision making and uh, moving forward. Um, thank you, Constantina. Um, I don't know if any of our um, participants uh, has. Uh, question, but uh, before we go to them, Johnny, did you want to come in? Yes, I would like to comment on something also that in addition to the use, uh, we should keep in mind that treating the effluent of industrial uh, wastewater has a good environmental impact. So today by adding tertiary treatment, by adding this additional uh, treatment, we are doing a good favor for our environment. This is on one point. On the second point, there is enough need in the industrial sector as I mentioned, all the oil fields, especially in the Gulf region, for the use of water. So let's work, let's focus on what's working, uh, and not today we'll focus on more what is socially accepted, which we understand for the potable water. I think there is enough need for industrial use of reused water in the agriculture, in road cleaning, in the oil fields, in the in the treatment of uh, cooling water. So let's focus on this and increase its application rather than try to use this reuse water for portable needs uh, for a while uh, until things uh, are socially more acceptable. And would you say, Johnny, that the Middle East leads the world in uh, water sustainability or attempts to um, uh, gain some water security? Because it is in the Middle East perhaps where the problem is the most urgent. Exactly, because the Middle East relies heavily on, on uh, seawater, the Middle East relies heavily on oil, and the Middle East relies heavily on cooling systems, so the Middle East could lead ex effectively uh, as a hot region in this field, definitely. And we have so many applications in this sector uh, in the whole region. 
And Dr. Alcaraz, you would second that as head of research for the Middle East Desalination Research Center. But, I mean, what about countries that are landlocked, that don't have access to seawater? Yeah, and even even for countries that don't have access to water, see obviously brackish water desalination is a uh, is another another uh, I mean uh, uh, obviously uh, technology that uh, could uh, produce uh, fresh water. But obviously also I mean uh, we, we, when we don't have seawater as a source of water, so we can definitely uh, make uh, take advantage of the of the wastewater and reuse it and uh, you know and uh, and uh, reuse it in agriculture and in other applications, including uh, a recharging aquifer that we didn't mention today. And, uh, and yes, I think uh, definitely treatment and reuse is uh, an important uh, water supply option that these counties need to invest in. And obviously, just the last point, in big projects, we need to encourage private-public partnership because big wastewater treatment plants cost, uh, I mean, are big projects, so we need definitely to encourage uh, such uh, partnerships. How do you do that? How do you encourage such partnerships? Because I agree they are the way forward. I mean, yeah, I mean, there are uh, incentives. I mean, the government uh, play a role in that and to bring, you know, to attract the, 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 uh, the, the private sector uh, in a win-win deal where we share risk and share, you know, benefits. And I think some successful projects in the region show, the, you know, how, how important to, uh, to build such partnership. I mean, uh, such an uh, approach like in uh, Herbert Samra in Jordan or Agadir plant in Morocco. So we have many successful stories here in the region. I think we need to encourage, I mean, the government uh, play a role, but also private sector play a role in approaching the, the stakeholders and uh, looking for uh, win-win deals. And I don't want to be over dramatic just to sort of close this uh, webinar with, but uh, everybody there, endemic water shortages might seem like a dystopian nightmare, but um, the reality is fast approaching, especially with, with climate change, isn't it? Dr. Al Harris first. Yes. I mean, definitely, I mean, climate change is, is, is exerting more pressure on water resources. Uh, obviously, we need to, to mainstream our actions. So the countries are committed to SDGs, are committed to Paris Agreement. Uh, um, Constantina mentioned the nexus. We need to uh, go for water, energy, food, uh, uh, climate nexus approaches. Uh, we need definitely more coordination between the actors in a way that we ensure water security, but also we ensure our commitment, uh, uh, I mean, uh, fulfilling our commitment to Paris Agreement. And Constantina? Uh, indeed, as a, it was also already part of the first you know, challenge that I presented, climate variability and change. So we really need to act very fast and we need to, to increase, as I said, our water budget to these non-conventional water resources. Uh, the technology is there, we know how to go about it, uh, we need uh, there are many things that we need, including, as we said, institutional framework, regulatory framework, um, and political will, participatory approaches. We need integrity and we need to set up all these PVP units in order to, to promote this model of moving forward. We cannot expect, you know, that this can be uh, recovered by the rates that we receive from water, so we need some serious investment there. There are many areas that we need to work on, and also, you know, on the other side of uh, making it available, making it safe for people to reuse it for whatever purpose, and then uh, ensuring that we have a way to, uh, first of all, to finance it and to, to properly do the maintenance works and keep the, the quality standards, you know, very high. All right. Thank you, Continue. A last word, Maki? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I see climate change in a two different ways. The first one, climate change is also uh, it's, a, it's a trait. It's, a, it's of course a difficult a challenge, but it's also uh, an incentive. Somehow, you know, we are forced to innovate. We are forced to go beyond the line. So, uh, non-conventional waters to increase the sources of water is an area that countries cannot anymore ignore. And there is also the improving the productivity of water. It's another area, you know, how to get best of the every drop of water that we already have. And maybe a third element is also how to manage the water demand, not only the offer, but how to reduce how the people are, I mean, using it, how the people are demanding. So education, in other words. Education, yeah. All right. Well, Maki, um, thank, you. thank you. And, and, and thank you, everyone, for attending this webinar series. Please note that we have our next webinar in a series scheduled for November.
which is again supported by the Al Atira Foundation in partnership with Refinitiv. We look forward to welcoming you again at our next webinar. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.